Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name's Emma and I'm the Events Officer at Hope for the Future. If you haven't heard of us already, Hope for the Future is a climate communications charity which works nationally to equip communities and individuals to communicate the urgency of climate change with their local politicians. As part of our work, we support individuals and groups to organise local events with their MPs, and that's what brings us here today. We're so pleased to be joined by local St Helens MPs, Mary Rimmer, who's on the call now, and Connor McGinn, who'll be joining us later. Um, so welcome to the event. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to give you a little backstory as to how this event came to be. Uh, we've been working with a really fantastic group of constituents in St Helens over the last few months, all of whom are incredibly concerned about the levels of fuel poverty in the town and across the region more broadly. Um, when we set out to look at running this event, we were connected really early on with some local experts working at the forefront of um, fuel poverty alleviation and energy efficiency in St Helens, uh, some of whom are joining us as speakers today. Um, whilst our kind of meetings with them really highlighted some of the amazing work that's taking place through organisations in St Helens, uh, like EP Plus and the Affordable Warmth Unit, um, it also really shone a light on some of the huge barriers that exist in terms of alleviating fuel poverty in a long term and sustainable way. Um, and those barriers kind of range from funding to infrastructure to training and accountability and capacity building. And we're going to be hearing more about those as we move through our event. So I'm really excited to welcome our expert um, speaking panel today, uh, who'll be delving into those barriers a bit more. Uh, but they're also going to be really focusing on those potential solutions that we have uh, to tackle those issues. So um, first up, I'll welcome our collaborators on this event from Energy Projects Plus. Uh, who'll be giving us a quick introduction to fuel poverty and the scale of the issue in St Helens. Um, we'll then be joined by Sarah Longlands, the director of IPPR North, who'll give us an overview of the dual crises of fuel poverty and climate change in the north of England, as well as kind of highlighting the mass, like the scale of the um, decarbonisation challenge that we're facing. Um, from here, we'll focus more on that local level, uh, where we'll be hearing from EP Plus and Prestige Skills, um, about some, some more details about those barriers that I mentioned at the start being experienced in St Helens and also you know, elsewhere in the UK. Uh, we're also really pleased to be joined by Philip Box from the UK Green Building Council, um, who will be setting out their retrofit playbook. Uh, this is a guide that UK GBC have developed to help local authorities retrofit properties, uh, existing properties en masse. Um, and I know that we have quite a few local councillors on the call today, so hopefully that will be of real interest to you. Um, and if you do have any questions for Philip about the playbook, please do pop them in the chat while he's presenting. Um, and then we'll hear from Annie Merry. Um, Annie will be talking about her experiences of working with local faith communities around the issues of climate, social and economic justice, and the importance of taking that people-centered approach when we're looking at addressing fuel poverty. Um, and then finally, we'll go into a Q&A session uh, facilitated by my colleague, Laura, uh, with our MPs and our guest speakers. Um, although Marie and Connor, when he joins, do feel free to pop any of your own questions into the chat as we uh, move through our event today. Uh, so we've got quite a lot to get through, uh, so I think we should crack on. Um, just before we get started, I've got some quick housekeeping. Uh, so the webinar will be recorded, um, it's being recorded now, uh, so it'll be available on demand for you to watch again and share uh, via our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be sending that link to you in a follow-up email this afternoon, as well as a link to some resources from our speakers. So some of the speakers are happy to share their slides, so I'll make sure you get those. Um, we're scheduled to finish by three o'clock today, and we'll do our absolute best to stick to time. Um, and finally, just before we make a start, um, I'd just like to ask that everyone be respectful of all the contributions that are given in today's event by our speakers, but also by your fellow attendees in the chat. Um, so, We'd also really encourage you to get involved in today's session um, by using the chat function. Uh, please do feel free to use that as a space now to introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining from. We particularly love to know if you know, you're joining us from St. Helens. Um, also on your dashboard, you'll see a question box. Uh, please post your questions for our speakers in there. And if you see a question that you'd also like to see the answer to, you can click the little thumbs up icon uh, next to the question and it will kind of go to the top of the list and we'll make sure to get those answered. Uh, we have already had a ton of questions, so if we don't get through them all today, um, I'm sorry, we'll try our best to get through as many as we possibly can in the Q&A at the end. 
Um, and then finally, at the end of the session today, a feedback form will pop up in your browser. Um, if you could take the time to fill it in, it's super short, but it's a massive help in um, 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 so um, I'll begin by welcoming our collaborators from Energy Projects Plus. Um, EP Plus is an, an independent not-for-profit organisation and registered environmental charity based in Wallasey. EP Plus exists to provide public education on energy efficiency and other environmental initiatives, including the alleviation of fuel poverty. I'm really delighted to welcome Dominic, uh, who's on the call today, uh, who's the business relationship manager at EP Plus. He'll be getting us started with a brief introduction to fuel poverty in St Helens. So if you're ready, Dominic, I will pass over to you. Thanks, Emma. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'd like to set the scene uh, locally by describing what fuel poverty is, what it does, and how we're working together to deliver solutions to it. So in terms of what fuel poverty is, in England, this is now measured using the low income, low energy efficiency indicator. Under the low income, low energy efficiency indicator, a household is considered to be fuel poor if A, they are living in a property with an energy efficiency rating of band D or below, and B, when they spend the required amount to heat their home to an adequate level, they are left with a residual income below the official poverty line. The fuel poverty statistics for 2019 published earlier this month show that an average of 13.4% of households in England were fuel poor, up from 10.3% in 2018 when a different fuel poverty indicator was used. As we speak, the sub-regional statistics haven't been compiled yet for the 2019 data, so we have to look at 2018 for the most recent statistics for St Helens. In 2018, the Office for National Statistics reported 11.3% of all households in St Helens were in fuel poverty, which is slightly better than the national average, but we can see quite a range at ward level where there is a, a difference between 9.1% of households of fuel poverty rising to 14.1% across St Helens. In Fatto Heath Ward, the range is between 6.1% to 20.3%, meaning fuel poverty affects one in five households in some neighbourhoods. We expect these figures will rise when the data for 2019 is published using the new low income, low energy efficiency indicator. In every ward in St Helens, there is an area with more than one in 10 households experiencing fuel poverty, and that is our mandate to take action. So what does fuel poverty do? The Office for National Statistics has reported there were 28,300 excess winter deaths in the year 2019 to 20. This excludes COVID mortality figures, which caused excess deaths outside the winter months. While we don't claim every excess winter death is preventable, the charity National Energy Action reports cold homes lead to approximately 10,000 deaths each winter. This is greater than the deaths attributed to road traffic collisions, alcohol and drugs combined. The picture in St Helens is that there were 100 excess winter deaths in the winter of 2018 to 19. The highest instances occurred in the wards of Rainhill, Billinge and Eccleston, which are actually some of the more affluent areas. Thankfully, there are four solutions to fuel poverty. The first solution is switching to a lower tariff. In partnership with St. Helens Council, Energy Projects Plus delivers the Merseyside Collective Switch project. We have over 14,000 members of our energy club. Several times each year, we go to the energy suppliers and obtain cheap tariffs that are available exclusively to our members. We then promote these tariffs alongside a full market comparison so everybody can select tariffs right for them. We've saved our members a collective £1.5 million through this project. The second solution is income maximisation, which literally means anything that brings additional funds into the household or helps to keep it there. For example, St Helens Council delivers the Warm Home Discount Campaign. This is a mailing to approximately 6,500 households each autumn, promoting the availability of a £140 discount from energy bills. Residents are advised to call the Save Energy Advice Line at Energy Projects Plus to check availability, eligibility and for support in making applications. This winter we have assisted 603 households with applications worth a combined £84,420. In addition to this, Energy Projects Plus has been involved in delivering multiple projects, providing emergency fuel vouchers for vulnerable residents. In St Helens, we've applied for 50 vouchers for 44 residents worth over £2,000. The third solution to fuel poverty is energy efficient home improvement. 
Um, the St Helens Affordable Warm for Welfare team assist qualifying households to access funding schemes such as the Warmed Homes Fund, which is delivered in partnership with Sefton and Lancashire councils to provide free first time central heating for vulnerable residents. They also manage the council's emergency fund, providing emergency repairs to heating systems where householders are at risk of ill health or hospitalisation. Energy Projects Plus delivers the LEAP project, which provides access to the ECHO scheme, which has installed 10 replacement boilers for St Helens this year. The final fourth solution to fuel poverty is energy efficient behaviour. The winter warmer campaign delivered by St Helens Affordable Warmth and Welfare Unit saw the distribution of close to 10,000 winter warmer calendars. The calendars contain useful information for people to stay safe, warm and well throughout the winter months, including details of where and how to access all the support available via the Affordable Warmth Outreach Team and wider support available, including Energy Projects Plus. The combined value of these activities that I've named for St Helens residents is over £100,000 for this year, which is real money in the pockets of some of the most disadvantaged households. Sorry, I was muted. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Dominic, uh, for sharing. Um, I'm just going to pull my notes back up. Um, so Dominic's given us a really great introduction to kind of fuel poverty and the state of things in St. Helens um, and the work that EP Plus are doing to alleviate that. Um, I'm now pleased to welcome Sarah Longlands, the director of IPPR North, a dedicated think tank for the north of England. Uh, Sarah is an expert in regional and local economic development, place resilience and land use planning. Uh, she believes passionately in the importance of speaking on behalf of the people and places that have so far been left out of the Northern Powerhouse debate. Uh, Sarah joins us today to provide us with an overview of, the, of fuel poverty and climate change in the north of England, highlighting the links between these two crises. Um, and Sarah will also set out, as I said before, the scale of the challenge that we're facing in terms of decarbonising the UK's existing housing stock, highlighting the themes that will kind of further be expanded on by our other speakers, including Peter, Paul, Philip, in the next part of the event. So, Sarah, if you're ready, I'll uh, hand over to you. Hi there, and um, hello to everyone uh, who's watching this, and thanks for the opportunity to, to join you this, this afternoon. Um, and thanks for that very warm introduction. Um, IPPR North has done lots of research um, on, on various different topics, thinking about the, the North of England and some of the challenges, as well as some of the opportunities that, that we face. And, and one of the things that we've become increasingly interested in is the debate on, on climate change and decarbonisation. Um, so as well as the work we've done looking at um, devolution and um, economic growth in the north of England, um, over the last few years we've done quite a bit looking at nature in the north and also um, the challenge of climate change. And just before Christmas we published a report looking at the challenge of, of decarbonising homes in the north. And, and what I want to talk to you briefly about this afternoon is um, how we see that challenge coming together with wider questions of, of social justice, because we believe that the, many of the drivers of climate change um, are also the drivers of um, poverty and, and hardship, particularly in regions like the North and Northwest. Uh, and so we believe that if we can um, you know, climate change is a massive challenge and, and one that often seems quite daunting. But if we can start to um, to get to grips with, with climate change, it's also an opportunity to get to grips with some of the, the social injustices that we see in, in our communities as well. So we see those two things as very closely linked, um, that you're not only tackling ecological injustice, but also social injustice. So I'd like to start just by giving you a bit of an overview of the scale of the challenge in the north of England as we see it. And this draws very much from the report that we published just before Christmas, which was called Northern Power Homes. Um, and uh, um, I think Emma's shared the link as well to that report. Uh, I've, and I've got some slides on this, but I thought I would rather just speak to you uh, and then share the slides afterwards because there's um, uh, quite a lot of information. So in, in the north of England, we have 731,000 um, fuel per homes, um, and that um, equates to about 11% of households in the north are what you would term fuel per, um, and that compares with 10% um, in, in England as a whole. So we are already above the average um, for fuel poverty um, in the north of England. And then when you drill down a little bit further, fuel poverty is even higher in the northwest of England. 
um, where it is at a rate of 12.5%. So higher again than the North and, and considerably higher than, than the national average. And then when we look again at that, um, areas like Liverpool um, have got the highest fuel poverty in the North and the third national highest um, figure nationally um, at, at 15%. So you start to see um, an escalation of, of fuel poverty in, in particular areas. And, um, and home heating and hot water accounts for about a quarter of our national energy use and in total around 15% of the emissions. And as a country, we are committed to um, eradicating carbon from our economic system by 2050. Um, and if we are to reach that figure, that sort of net zero um, figure by 2050, then we will need to, um, to retrofit all of our domestic homes, as well as our industries and everything along with it. But we will need to retrofit domestic properties so that they are not producing um, carbon to anywhere like the same extent um, that they are at the moment. And that is where the debate on, on fuel poverty comes in. And I guess the, the kind of logical question from this is, you know, I've, I've set out the scale of the challenge in the North and in particular the Northwest, but why have we in the North got such a sort of disproportionate level um, of, of fuel poverty um, compared to other regions of England? Um, well, this, I think, I think this really links back to some of the work we've done a lot on um, as an organisation, and it, it is the fact that the, the, um, the UK is one of the most regionally unequal countries um, in Western Europe, actually. So if you live in the north of England, um, you're more likely to have a, a lower income. It's more difficult to find a job. Um, you're, you're more likely to get sick earlier in your life than, than other parts of England. Um, and, and also issues around um, health and, and educational um, attainment are, are also much more um, severe in parts of the north. So, for example, uh, I know a higher percentage of people in the north of England um, haven't had the chance um, to get the same skills as, as people elsewhere. So there's that, a basic problem there that our economy um, doesn't have the same opportunity to grow as other parts of, of uh, the UK. Uh, and that means that incomes are lower in the north compared with, with other parts of the UK. And we know from the research we've done that 1.5 million working people earn less than the real living wage, which is £9.50. And that's slightly different from the government's minimum wage, which is £8.72. And we also know that 40% of women of working age earn less than the real living wage as well. So we've got a, a, an issue to start with that um, not only um, uh, do people have to, uh, to try harder to find a job, but, but when they do, they will earn less money. Um, as a result, making fuel costs uh, a, a trickier challenge for, for people as well as housing um, uh, as well. And then second of all, housing quality in the North and the Northwest tends to be much poorer. In fact, um, in the UK as a whole, we have some of the most inefficient housing in the whole of Europe. 24% um, of all homes in the North were built before 1919, um, often very quickly, particularly in places like St Helens because of the speed at which industry grew. And 44% of our, our houses in the North um, uh, were built before 1944. So quite often without the normal kind of modern building standards that, that we've come to expect nowadays. And in fact, when you look at levels of, of what are called non-decent homes, so non-decent homes are, are homes that are judged by the decent home standard and they lack, they will typically lack modern facilities, um, they're being in a poor state of repair um, and they don't have adequate heating systems. About 43% of homes in the Northwest alone are considered to be non-decent. So that starts to build a picture as to why we in the North and the Northwest have a, a much higher percentage of, of fuel poverty than other parts of, of the country. And I guess just to, to kind of, to, to, to bring that into context and to try and bring those issues together with the, the question of fairness, um, we argue very much that these issues that, that we see in the North around um, social injustice and around income and, and around um, poverty, that these are also the same factors that are driving climate change. Um, and so we argue that a solution to this needs to be um, uh, about tackling not just um, uh, climate change, but also some of those challenges of poverty and hardship for people who, um, who are suffering most as a result of, of fuel poverty. Because homes that are better insulated, that are warm and cheaper to run are also better for people's health and for their wallet. Better homes, better neighbourhoods create much better places for people to live and, and to, to raise families. Um, and of course, there are also local economic benefits from that as well, uh, including jobs and training, particularly in retrofit industries, 
uh, and also opportunities for business development. And that was something that we explored a lot in the research that we did before Christmas. Um, you know, for example, if you want to retrofit homes in this country, the sort of 95% of homes in, in the UK use a gas boiler. If we're going to move to um, a lower carbon um, uh, solution for, for home heating in, in the future, then we'll need to think about things like um, heat pumps. Um, and at the moment, we have 10,000 accredited gas fitters uh, across, across the UK and only 600 um, uh, plumbers or heating engineers who are, who are qualified to be able to heat, to, to fit a heat pump. Um, so there's a, a challenge there, but there's also a real opportunity for people to diversify their businesses, to get new skills and potentially um, to, to develop new jobs and opportunity as a result. Um, and the final thing I want to mention is that, you know, whilst there's obvious advantage here in terms of um, helping both in terms of climate change and, and um, uh, issues around poverty and hardship, the big message that's comes from, come from our research, both in, in the North and, and elsewhere, is that we've got to do this with people. People have got to feel that they have ownership of the action being proposed and being taken, particularly if it concerns um, the home in which they're living or the community in, in which they live. And we've done a series of um, citizens' juries in, in, uh, in many parts of, of the country exploring this issue. And one of the big conclusions from that is that fairness is, needs to run through the whole process, that no one is left out of the process, that action must not just deal with climate and nature emergencies, but also make things better for the people um, who live in an area. Um, and, and that also means um, not only working with people, but making sure that local areas like St Helens have got the opportunity to create their own plans and priorities based on the, the local context and not just um, whatever is a sort of a one size fits all, fits all approach that, it, that is foisted it upon them. So thanks very much for, um, for, for uh, inviting me along this afternoon. And um, I hope what I've said is useful. I'm very happy to share some of the links, both to the, work res the, to the research that we've done and also to send uh, through a copy of, of some of the statistics that I mentioned in terms of the scale of the challenge in the North. So thanks very much. I'll pan back to Emma. Hi, Sarah. Uh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for providing such um, a great introduction uh, to our event and also highlighting some of the really interesting research that IPPR has been uh, working on in terms of the North and fuel poverty. Um, if you're okay to pop your video back on, I was just going to ask you a quick follow-up question. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't get away that easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to ask you, um, we talked a lot about fairness. Um, yeah. In your opinion, what does fairness look like in UK climate policy and how fair are the current policies that the UK has in place to shift to a low carbon future? Um, I think the the um, it's quite a tricky Good one. That. Question. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think the 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 answer is really that um, I think we have a way some way to go. Yeah. Um, I think we have made sort of, you know, you know, good, some good progress, um, but I think it really feels still like um, sort of slight tiny baby steps towards what we really need to achieve. And I think that one of the, the biggest challenges we face is that the, state, the, whole, the whole challenge still seems fairly remote um, from, um, fr from people who uh, are living in, in homes that perhaps are, are fuel poor um, and, um, uh, and, and there's not necessarily the incentives in place to support them to uh, to move to a, a, a better form of heating, um, but also for businesses out there who could potentially be supporting this um, effort. Uh, and I think still there isn't enough um, support for, um, for for communities to be able to understand what the, what's in it for them really in terms of the advantages and, and the kind of the right support um, to, to support them through it as well. So I think there's a I think there's also um, there's also a big question um, about how this whole process is communicated. And I think it's still too much of a sort of um, diktat from, from Westminster and too much um, uh, kind of messaging around what happens centrally and not enough kind of what's happening locally and what can we actually do to, to deal with it um, on, our, on our own doorstep. And some of the work that we've just published a report yesterday, which actually showed that loads of communities across the UK are getting on and taking action for themselves. Um, and I think the more that we that, that government and, and other organisations can do to support communities to get involved and, and to take decisions for themselves, um, the better, because I don't think this this crisis is going to be solved by um, by by simply relying on a, on a big kind of box solution from from Westminster. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll pick up on some more of those things that you raised around you know, awareness raising and skills gap in uh, Peter and Paul's talks next.
Um, so um, I would like to welcome Peter Owen next from EP Plus. Uh, Peter originally trained and practiced as um, an architectural technician. Uh, sorry, I've just lost my notes. Um, an architectural technician in the 1980s and 90s, working in both local authority and private sector team. He joined Energy Projects Bus in 2000 after working as an energy efficiency officer uh, in Cheshire Local Authority and became the charity's chief executive in 2001. He's a keen advocate of co the community approach to energy efficiency and carbon reduction as a means to tackle fuel poverty and climate change. Uh, so many thanks for joining us today, Peter, and for all your input into the development of this event over the last few weeks. Um, so I'll, I'll pass over to you now. Thanks, Emma. Um, and I'm feeling really old now that you've read all that out. Um, so I've been asked to outline some of the barriers or challenges we face in our goal to eradicate fuel poverty across St. Helens. Um, my focus is on the physical elements of the homes uh, and the funding needed to support measures, as well as the funding available to help those in or at risk of fuel poverty. Um, so whilst it's couched in terms of barriers and challenges, I, I think it's important to highlight that uh, these barriers aren't insurmountable. Um, and indeed, they create a, a range of opportunities, um, some that are available now and some that can be um, that we're coming down the track but they can be grasped if we are ready and willing. Um, and it was interesting to, I, I totally endorse what Sarah was saying then about uh, um, messaging and communication to communities and the, the necessity for the local message to be to get out there. Um, so whilst I'm addressing the retrofit need and, and the funding that's required, I think the other thing we've got to remember, and again, Sarah mentioned it, is the perspective of the occupants in the home. They will be crucial to any programs that, uh, that happen. Um, so, uh, what are the homes in St. Helens? Um, using figures from St. Helens Council's fuel poverty strategy, which is available on their website, um, we can see that approximately one in six homes were constructed before 1930 and are therefore likely to need solid wall insulation, um, as opposed to the relatively easy sort of cavity wall insulation. Um, a significant proportion of these homes are the, those traditional long terraces the front directly onto the pavement are sort of the Coronation Street type uh, uh, areas. And they have yards at the, at the rear as well, which also then creates its own limitations. Um, so if you're trying to insulate um, th those walls, you're starting to look at how, what do we need to do to future-proof them? So it isn't just putting a little bit of insulation in, it has to be a sort of a, a fundamentally robust uh, thing to, to make sure that whoever moves into that property would be fuel poverty proof and um, carbon reduction proof as well. Um, so you're looking at the front elevation, they, they front directly onto the street. So uh, and that's quite attractive uh, properties. Uh, you can't just bang um, sort of rendered insulation on the front, it would totally change the street scene. Um, so you have to do it um, internally. I mean, even if it wasn't an issue in terms of the um, attractiveness of it, uh, the fact that they, they, they do put onto the street, you might be encroaching onto the pavement, which creates its own uh, issues. Um, insulating internally also though brings its own issues um, around the loss of the room space. Now, generally it, it isn't an issue um, because um, the room can take it if you're looking at say terrace properties and you're only encroaching from the front elevation. Um, but it also includes things like, well, if there's sockets on the wall, light switches, they need to be moved. Um, and, and as someone who's, who's rented a house in the past where the third bedroom was really a box room, um, and I actually could only just fit a bed in there. If I take an inch or so off that bed, off that room space, I cannot fit my bed in. So there are practical issues around that. Um, and of course, externally insulating, you've got the issues around sort of um, rainwater goods, gutters, um, satellite dishes, you know, the, the telephone sort of uh, points. So they all have to be addressed. Um, in St. Helens also, there's, there, there are states uh, with solid wall semi-detached properties that are now mixed tenure. They originally started as council housing estates. Uh, social housing providers have taken them over and they've installed external wall insulation to them. But what that leaves then is, is of course, a pepper-potted um, number of properties around the estate which aren't improved. Um, and so that just creates create sort of a, a separate issue around, um, as I say, no, but unless you can do long terraces, you know, to, to make it cost effective, you do this, the extra cost of pepper potting does, does come into play. Um, and there's also concrete 
solid wall properties, no finance properties built in estates in St. Helens, which again, a mixed tenure and they successfully have external wall insulation, but again, the private properties are, 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 are private rented are yet to be done. Um, so that, that sort of insulation element, but, but then obviously um, Sarah mentioned heating. I mean, over 98% of homes in central heating have got, um, sorry, 98% of homes in, in St. Helens have got central heating. Um, and so that then creates an issue around the decarbonization programs because the, the, the shift is to move away from uh, fossil fuel systems. Um, but we need to make sure that um, sort of fuel poor, low income households aren't left behind. Um, and in terms of heating um, you know, and decarbonization, the government itself is, is driving towards sort of non-fossil fuel. Um, they, they will stop funding replacement of um, fossil fuel boilers um, as, as outlined in their fuel poverty uh, strategy that was released uh, a few weeks ago. Um, locally, there are proposals to use um, hydrogen as an alternative fuel to mains gas. That's initially been trialed by introducing um, a sort of a, a, a mix of 20% hydrogen to the existing gas supplies. Um, and and that, that we, we look with interest on that, but there are issues around the production of hydrogen uh, from a decarbonization perspective, but also the practicality um, is that uh, uh, the mains gas boilers that exist now can't operate on 100% hydrogen. So you're looking at a, a major replacement boiler program in its own right. The electric solution, uh, heat pumps, um, are tried and tested, and they've been installed in social housing across the country. Um, they are slightly different from the traditional gas boiler systems. Um, they're more bulky, and where gas boilers can be integrated easily into the into the home, you know, effectively wall mounted in amongst your wall wall cupboards. Um, heat pump needs a different space, um, and the supply of heat it's also at a lower temperature, so a different approach, sort of so managing it, controlling it, and and expectations from the occupants also has to be um, yeah, included. Um, the, the links to the perspective of the occupants of the home are crucial to the successful in, uh, achievement of, of these programs. Um, you know, each home is, is different, is unique. Each occupant is, is almost unique as well. Um, challenges that are faced just by the implementation, implementation of sim simple programs like cavity wall and loft insulation programs. You know, some people, just will not accept the disruption. They do not understand the technology and won't accept the technology. Um, and that's for simple insulation measures like loft and cavity wall. Um, there's, there's also other issues around disrepair to the property. So it needs um, measures done to the property before it can even be considered for an improvement. Um, and also other things like um, hoarding, um, cleanliness. So, you know, we, we, we work on programs with local authorities where we try and get um, replacement heating. And sometimes installers have said, we cannot go into that property. You know, it is, it is, it is a health hazard. So as I say, each, each property has its own unique um, element to it. And as Sarah said, one size fit all cannot, uh, cannot be the solution. Uh, and that is where we have to take on board the, the local authority and local community support. Um, you know, charities like ourselves, um, spend our time engaging frontline with individuals to persuade them to take measures up and just to help them overcome any issues that arise. Um, so even if the, the householder wants to take the measure um, and already are willing to take that measure, um, the, the major issue is likely to be funding. We are talking in this context of fewer poor households. Um, by their nature, they're unlikely to have any savings and, and access to credit uh, could prove very difficult to them. So, you know, it, it, it's, um, it does really look to sort of the state and local government to, uh, to offer some financial support to achieve it. Um, there are funding schemes out there, however, you know, for, for many years we've had ECO and its predecessor, CERT and um, CESP schemes where they've done uh, lofty cavity wall boiler replacements. Um, that, that has been confirmed as continuing for another six years, I think, from um, um, from 2022. Um, so the government is, is, is putting its funding into it, but it would appear that uh, the government is looking more towards insulation and less heating in that respect, which is good for our solid wall and, and more highly, but it, uh, um, you know, it leaves a doubt as to where does it leave those householders who cannot afford to get their boiler fixed or cannot afford to get a boiler replacement. 
Um, we, we, we wait and see what happens on that. We have the Green Homes Grant, um, which uh, is available to uh, able to pay households who have to pay up them a sort of a third of the cost of any measures installed. Um, that's aimed at um, 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 so, so heat pumps and the like, solid wall insulation. It does have secondary measures, but you have to have a primary measure installed first. We found through our advice line from the, when it was announced sort of uh, last year that um, there was significant um, interest in it, but, but also uncertainty around it. They, they wanted double glazing and they wanted heating and suddenly they found they couldn't have it. So communication is the key there. Um, you've got so also the Green Homes Grant Local Authority Delivery. Um, that's funding for local authorities and across the city, Liverpool city region, the local authorities have stepped up and have secured funding for it. Um, there may well be some, um, some funding being um, um, obtained for St. Helens Council to, to do some solid wall insulation across um, certain estates. Um, and we've also got uh, local schemes, um, such as obviously St. Helens Council, as, as Dominic mentioned earlier, have got, have got uh, funding available for in emergency cases. We ourselves can access certain funding and you've got the uh, LEAP programme, which offers easy measures and potential boiler replacements. Um, all of these things will, will help almost on an ad hoc basis to support households in need, but it's, it, it, it in no way near goes, um, can help deliver, deliver a, a programme of activity. So we do need to move um, to these planned programmes of large scale initiatives, but we mustn't forget the immediate needs of householders. Uh, the fuel poverty strategy I mentioned before is moving towards fabric first approaches, i.e. insulation, reduce the heat demand, and therefore means that uh, the necessity for the heating systems is, is reduced. Um, however, households can lead those complicated lives. They do need that local support to navigate the systems. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, we don't want to, to, to set off um, at, at a pace and then find that uh, we've been confounded by, um, by local or individual issues. Um, and one of the, the report that uh, Sarah mentioned before, it does, does call for social housing to be the vanguard of the decarbonisation. And I think that's uh, an excellent idea because they can um, develop programmes at scale and develop the solutions at scale. Um, and also the, the idea of we must, we must do it with the occupants, not to the occupants. I think is a crucial message. Um, so I'll close by just saying that um, you know the support that is out there will continue, but it does need local authorities, communities, and central government to come together alongside utilities to create cohesive programs that take account of the funding available, but also the intricacies of the individual unit. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, that was brilliant. And I'm, I'm sure that we'll pick up um, more on, you know, some of those issues around funding and the Green Homes Grant and its potential continuation and, you know, the issues around its delivery. I'm sure uh, Philip will also, you know, pick up on some of those local authority um, capacity aspects. Um, I'm actually going to welcome Paul in um, now um, and we'll move on to your talk. Uh, so Paul is the director of Prestige Skills. Uh, Prestige Skills is a company heavily involved in metering and the Green Deal. Their engineers have completed work in over 50,000 properties in the last 12 months. And Paul has over 40 years of experience within this industry. Uh, he's a technical expert in dual fuel smart meters and endpoint assessors. Um, he also oversees their apprenticeship rollout. So Paul joins us today to discuss the current skills gap in the industry, which Sarah and uh, Peter have already covered. Um, touched upon um, and to give insight into how training can be future-proofed in this industry. So Paul, I'll pass over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we're talking today on how we're going to reduce fuel poverty in St. Helens. For me, it must be linked with retrofit apprenticeships and local delivery partnerships. Skills and green apprenticeships will play a big part in the green recovery. The government is now planning to create and support 2 million good quality green jobs by 2030 to support the UK transition to net zero. Looking forward into the green apprenticeship, we need to look at the current apprenticeship to ensure they meet the needs of the employers within the growing green economy. Then look at creating new apprenticeships to reflect a new occupation to meet the challenges to reach net zero. 
The National Retrofit Programme running to 2050 calls for a sustainable period, high investment, quality retrofit, rather than the short-term economic stimulus packages of the past. An intensive period of recruitment and training to create apprenticeship jobs and skills will be needed. Training and future proofing for green apprentices, solar PV, car charging, EV, renewable systems, A-rated saving, energy window systems, high performance door, insulation, internal wall, external wall, cavity wall, loft and underfloor insulation. Currently a 12 week funded course, MVQ level two, smart, efficient heating, and rolling forward to hydrogen, as was just mentioned, smart meters. All these would facilitate the need for apprenticeships, electrical apprenticeships, joinery apprenticeships, plumbing apprenticeships, plastering apprenticeships, gas service engineer apprenticeships, smart meter and apprenticeship, then the ones that want to move up can upskill to commercial and industrial. But there are barriers to accessing apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are available to anybody over the age of 16 living in England. And although there are different entry requirements depending on the sector and the job. However, although they are available, they are not currently accessible to all. And a disappointment of the social mobility and inclusion, young people from low income families, females and ethnic minority groups face higher barriers than others. Barriers to accessing apprenticeships include financial, insufficient household income, geographical location, lack of access to information and careers advice, ethnicity, relatively limits transferability of apprenticeship qualifications, prior qualifications being under and overqualified, an application process that's difficult to navigate, gender stereotype and segregation, lack of apprenticeship flexible hours. This is where employees come into it. Employees have an important role in reducing the barriers to accessing apprenticeships. They can encourage the government to invest in widening participation in apprenticeship, advice and guidance resources, and lobby for employer financial incentives. In addition, employees must be actively engaged in outreach activities to showcase their apprenticeship program and ensure public promotion of commitment to inclusion by featuring diverse role models on websites and promotional material and include diverse apprenticeships in their outreach programs. Employers should extend their flexible and part-time working policies to their apprenticeship programs and take action to remove any reduce the barriers and widen participation in the apprenticeship. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was brilliant. Um, I'd just like to ask you a quick follow-up question, if that's all right. Um, I just wondered um, what kind of incentives would you like to see made available to support local employers to offer apprenticeships and to encourage more young people to enroll, uh, particularly you know, um, more young people from more diverse backgrounds, as you mentioned in your talk? Yeah, I, th I think if financial is the one, uh, and then with financial, there's also a status uh, we tend to have gone to people wanting degrees and moving into education, and we haven't put the same thought into apprenticeships. Uh, so I think we need to try and level them up somehow, not just on a financial side, but also on basically uh, how people perceive them. I think that's where we need to go. And as for uh, bringing in more diverse people, whether it's ethnic, female, or even the, the poor community, uh, they, they've just got to work on channel through them individually, but really work on them and be proactive. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm now going to welcome our next speaker, uh, Philip Box. Um, Philip is a public affairs and policy officer at the UK Green Building Council, um, having worked previously at the think tank Bright Blue on energy and climate change, um, and also at the National Trust and the Churches Conservation Trust. Uh, Philip specialises in nature and climate adaptation policy 
and currently works on UK GBC's Accelerator Cities programme, which we're going to hear more about today. And that's a work stream focused on unlocking the potential of local authorities to deliver home retrofit and energy efficiency locally. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the retrofit playbook, and I'm sure you all are too. So I'll pass over to you, Philip. There we go. I'm unmuted. Um, so, yeah, so we've heard about this, the scale of the challenge and some of the problems ahead for retrofits. And I'm going to talk through some of the work the UK Green Building Council has been doing on locally led solutions to our Accelerator Cities programme. So just as a quick introduction to who we are, UKGBC is a charity and membership organisation with over 500 business members from across the construction and property sectors. Uh, committed to transforming the sustainability of the built environment. So we began our Accelerated Cities programme back in 2019 with the support of EIT Climate Kick. And our starting position was that there has been a systemic failure to tackle the retrofit challenge compounded by piecemeal national policy, difficulties in engaging with householders and a lack of sustainable business models. And although central government will be key to overcoming certain barriers, local leadership will be essential. And it is also clear that ambitious local authorities can achieve much more through collective action and joining up their respective efforts. So essentially our Accelerator Cities program aimed to support individual local authorities to develop their own home retrofit programs through sharing best practice. It aims to encourage greater partnership between industry and NGOs working in this space. Uh, it looks to coordinate cities' engagement with central government and to provide a coordinated approach in respect to the links with financial, financial institutions and different funding opportunities. So for the first phase of the project in 2019, we conducted a series of workshops with local authorities on the barriers to home retrofit programmes across the UK. I won't go through this diagram in detail as we've seen already some of the key barriers that have been faced by local authorities, but it serves as a useful illustration of some of the common concerns that came out of our uh, Pathfinder projects, such as things like finance, uh, technical concerns over the performance gap, supply chain, tenure issues, and the, the problem of national policy. So next, we developed a blueprint for what a city home, a city led home retrofit program could look like. And we obviously needed to then go into the next level of practical detail to develop uh, different guidance for all of these different areas. And so looking specifically at areas such as finance, uh, skills and trading, and also the, the, the wider strategic picture about how local authorities can develop their own strategies going forwards. So what is the retrofit playbook? In 2020, with the help of a steering group of partners, uh, we created the, the playbook, which is a live document um, that local authorities can dip into to look at different sections for different elements of a successful retrofit program. It offers a spectrum of activities that local authorities of all sizes can engage with and builds on the number of different roles that they can play in supporting home retrofit. It is also accompanied by an interactive map that uh, charts best practice examples of key policies and initiatives from across the UK. So the different roles are possible, uh, different possible roles for local authorities are explored across all six parts of the playbook and each section starts with some key actions for local authorities. I won't go through every recommendation in detail, but I'll pick out a few key ones from each section. Uh, so, for example, in part one, producing an overarching retrofit strategy, we recommend key actions such as convening a coalition of willing partners to take forward and help resource the development of a local retrofit strategy. And secondly, baselining the current circumstances of the local authority, for example, looking at uh, stock data, the skills profile of the area and the resources available, etc. Uh, that section also covers things like um, how to set targets for retrofit, how to monitor the impacts, and also some leading example strategies. The second part is uh, 
focused on the one-stop shop model, which is a specific template for a hands-on local authority-led retrofit program. The one-stop shop is where multiple services are bundled together to offer homeowners an end-to-end -end whole house retrofit journey. Uh, services that handhold people through the entire retrofit process with independent advice from a trusted source have been found to be much more successful. And a key to this approach is the role of the retrofit coordinator that can provide tailored professional advice to the homeowner and create a whole house plan for retrofit. And the playbook signposts to the Innovate Guide, which is a more detailed guidance document on how local authorities can set up a, a one-stop shop model. Uh, so part three is on communications, and this looks at how local authorities can communicate with residents about things like the Green Homes Grant, but also how important it is for local authorities to engage on the benefits of retrofit, the importance of having a holistic whole house retrofit plan as opposed to doing uh, piecemeal measures that can often cause um, unforeseen problems and also the importance of only using accredited installers and suppliers. As local authorities are a trusted source of information, this is a vital and relatively low resource activity that they can engage with. And this section of the playbook also looks at how to develop a comprehensive communication strategy that considers different factors such as tenure types, key trigger points such as when people move home, and also common, common barriers such as risk aversion. Part four is the finance section, which is undoubtedly one of the most important. And we consider finance in terms of two separate areas. Firstly, how to fund the development and delivery of a local authority-led retrofit strategy. And some ideas here include convening an early meeting of the relevant cross-department officers and politicians to secure buy-in and co-ownership of the retrofit strategy as a funding priority going forwards. And secondly, preparing a full stock assessment that supports funding applications. So when central government funding streams become available, local authorities are ready to move quickly and apply. And secondly, we talk about um, supporting the role of local authorities in terms of retrofit finance for householders. So recommendations here include looking at the work that the UK Green Building Council has been doing with partners, including the Green Finance Institute, on emerging funding models and how householders should be given a clear menu of financial options with advice on how they can be combined, including information on specific funding mechanisms such as green leases, metered energy savings and energy saving ICEs. And there's also a possible role here for financial coordinators to work alongside retrofit coordinators in the one-stop shop model that I mentioned earlier. Uh, recently, the UK Green Building Council and the Green Finance Institute uh, hosted a retrofit finance workshop with local authorities and leading uh, financiers, which looked at the best practice uh, that's currently being developed in terms of designing retrofit projects that are investable for financiers and deliverable for local authorities. And it also examined the latest financial innovations to support wide scale retrofitting in the UK and a write-up of that workshop is available on our website. And for part five, we've already slightly covered this, but this was about skills and the supply chain, as it's very important that local authorities understand the initial status of their local supply chain, including the skills within their local area, and then map this against demand. This means considering the unique demands of your local building stock, as there can be technical issues to be aware of, such as we've heard about with traditional buildings that can have specific skills demands. And just as the householder needs to be led uh, through a smooth retrofit journey, so the supply chain needs its own journey. And local authorities should aim to create an action plan to develop and support local skills and the local supply chain. And we see a role here for the various retraining schemes that have been deployed by the central government in the wake of the COVID crisis. And finally, we look at the role of social landlords, as these can be a powerful delivery partner, as we've mentioned already. And local authorities can proactively engage with RSLs as part of their wider strategy development or set up a forum for RSLs to work collaboratively. And these forums can act as a space to share learning, connect social landlords with the supply chain, 
or facilitate joint bids for grant funding. Uh, so what next for Accelerator Cities? Well, over the next year, the programme will continue to build the evidence base to help local authorities overcome the challenges faced in terms of retrofitting programmes. Uh, our work will be focused on, on these key work streams. So we're going to continue to update the retrofit playbook to cover issues such as the uh, climate resilience of the building stock, how to cope with extreme weather and also the implications of retrofit for biodiversity enhancement. We're going to continue to communicate best practice online through various events and engage with central government through our policy work and focus more later on in the year to, on specific pilots and exemplar projects. And given the level of interest in the project, we're also looking to potentially uh, change the name from just a city's focus to embrace that wider relevance of the programme for local authorities across the UK. So that's my presentation and I shall hand back over. Thanks Philip. Um, that was super interesting and um, I want to ask you a question um, about the delivery of the programme. So we've already discussed the skills gap in terms of the supply chain um, and also you know, training but there potentially is a skills gap in who can coordinate this. Um, I know you said that local authorities, and it's well known, local authorities are well placed to deliver community programmes and locally based programmes. But in your kind of communication with local authorities, have you come across any kind of concerns about their capacity to deliver, like such plans like the retrofit uh, playbook? in terms of their capacity to deliver on particularly the skills gap or just to deliver yeah. a comp just, um, um being like um well placed themselves to deliver it in terms of the technical aspects and stuff like that i think that the in terms of our engagement with local authorities that uh, in terms of their capacity to develop retrofit strategies or to develop uh skills programs it wasn't necessarily that there was um, across our kind of engagement workshops, there wasn't necessarily a capacity problem in terms of having specific staff that were working on that kind of area. It was just a, a question of how they can overcome wider barriers about financing and um, how to capitalise on central government funding and how to utilise existing funding effectively, as well as a question of well, where do you start in terms of a retrofit strategy? What, what are the first steps that I need to do? Or how can I communicate that to the officer in charge of decarbonisation in X council? It needs, so it was about providing that, that guidance for the local authority to have the confidence to take that forward not, and also to, to look at some of the wider barriers that they face in, in developing the strategy, not necessarily about their uh, capacity internally to do it once they've worked out where they need to go. Okay. No, that's really interesting. And um, you said you've had a lot of interest in the program. What's kind of the, what does the rollout look, out, look like from this point for you? Um, so we're currently waiting for the next phase to begin for this year as the, the previous phase concluded at the end of last year. So uh, in terms of the rollout, we'll continue to engage with local authorities, as, as, I, as I said, to update the playbook and to bring in supporters to engage with the guidance that we produce as a, a consequence. So we've had this specific work stream on finance with the Green Finance Institute, and the next step will probably build more on that in terms of looking at pilots. And as, as I said, exploring the relationship with other subject areas, such as climate resilience and biodiversity and how retrofit can support those as well as tackling the climate mitigation side. Brilliant. Uh, and it's great to see the inclusion of uh, towns as well as cities uh, mm -hmm. in the new uh, in the new title. Accelerated um, counties was another one, which oh. we had quite a few county councils getting involved as well. Oh, brilliant! Um, thank you so much, Philip, and uh, I hope you stick around for the questions at the end. Um, so finally, I'd like to welcome Annie Merry. Um, Annie has led Faith for Change since two thousand and four. Um, and working on various collaborative community projects, including with uh, Energy Projects Plus, who we've already heard from today, and South Sefton Food Bank. Uh, Annie has a background in community work, uh, focusing primarily on youth homelessness, holistic drug and alcohol services, environmental activism, and waste management. 
Um, and I'm, we're so pleased to invite Annie to speak today because um, she'll be sharing lessons that she's learned from working with um, and learning from local faith communities uh, through, through her work with Faith for Change. So uh, I'll pass over to you, Annie, and then we'll head into the Q&A after. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much, Emma, and uh, good afternoon. Just in that photo of me with very windswept hair, so <laughs> looking a bit more un under control at the moment. Um, so good afternoon. Um, just to say we've been busy working with faith communities, the communities they serve, and partners from different sectors on climate and earth care projects since 2004. The focus of these projects have included water, land, buildings, resources, awards, education, communications, and fuel poverty. Integral to all of these is the health and well-being of people. Justice and fairness, as we've heard from previous speakers, are crucial factors in becoming a truly sustainable society. During Interfaith Week in 2017, we began to explore opportunities with partners to create an umbrella network, a faith and climate network across the city region, starting on the Wirral. Wirral's climate change strategy identifies the unique role faith communities play in addressing climate change. They reach into local communities through worship and non-worship services ownership of buildings, land, education, networks, and many other resources, crucially underpinned by a moral imperative to act. In common to all faiths, caring for the earth is completely bound up in caring for communities. The 40 plus members of different faith communities attending the initial event in 2017 shared a host of actions they were already taking on climate change locally. Things including creating and distributing meals and food, nature and land-based spaces, walking to worship, clothing distribution, to name but a few. An area that many wanted to address was energy efficiency and fuel poverty. This became the focus of a Faith and Climate Network 2018 Interfaith Week partnership event hosted by the Wirral Dean Centre in Birkenhead with support from Energy Projects Plus and others. It offered the mosque and the imam an opportunity to explore and share Islamic ecology and climate change understanding, growing all of our understandings of the similarities and opportunities to grow climate change responses together. We learned about energy efficiency, fuel poverty and fuel debt the opportunities and challenges we needed to act on locally, regionally and nationally. Training awareness and information to share are key. A simple referral process created by Energy Projects Plus has led many faith communities to offer understanding and direct support to those in fuel poverty and fuel debt. Faith communities have a considerable reach and can play a substantial role in positive change. Social justice has already been mentioned, addressing unfairness and inequality and working for equality and equity is key to addressing environmental, ecological and climate crises, including fuel poverty. Fuel inefficient homes are financially costly, mostly for those who can least afford them. Increasing the likelihood of fuel debt and excess winter deaths has already been mentioned. And in summer, as our climate heats, housing may become intolerably warm. Our homes are carbon costly, in common with many faith community buildings, aging and large and not well insulated. Energy efficient homes erad and eradicating fuel poverty pose significant challenges to policymakers as we aim to reach carbon net zero within 10 to 20 years. One leading faith community, the Church of England, has committed to reach carbon net zero by 2030, local authorities 10 or so years later. There are significant opportunities to learn and resource this work that we need to do in partnership 
with many faith communities and other organizations from all sectors as, a, as has already been suggested, informed by research and innovation that is already happening and already exists to create policy and strategies that benefit people and the planet long-term. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Annie. Um, it was really interesting to hear about the work that you've been doing, particularly with uh, EP Plus, who's obviously on the call today. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, in your experience and from your experience of working in the community in St Helens, how do you think that we can better support local communities uh, to get involved in current initiatives to reduce their energy costs and increase household efficiency? Um, I think it would be useful to kind of start uh, grow some dialogue, partly as, as you've already said, uh, with EPP, with uh, local councillors. I personally would engage with CVS um, and uh, networks such as the Churches Together, um, who will be in touch with other faith communities in St Helens. And my knowledge of faith communities in St Helens is, is sadly not um, as, as good as it is on the Wirral, but I'm happy to, the kind of work that we're doing um, on this um, and beyond fuel poverty, including working with the Faith Leaders Network for the city region, I'm happy to kind of pitch in there and, and share any information and contacts that I can. I know that we've we shared quite a lot of uh, contacts uh, with faith communities prior to this event. Um, anything we can do to enable different organisations to come to the table to play a part in this work, I think is essential. As has already been said, the resources needed are so significant. And yes, it does require a kind of long term commitment from central government to make those resources available. But as has already been said, bringing people with you and learning from the people that you're trying to engage, that recognizing the different psychologies, I think, as, as has already been said, housing types and, and how people live is, is crucial. And I think faith communities have a unique role to play in that, quite often being trusted partners at local level and certainly long term uh, community activists. Yeah, that's a brilliant point, uh, Annie. Um, and thank you for your contributions today. I'm sure that we'll touch on them more in the uh, in the Q&A part of this event and the discussion. Um, so I'm going to move on now. Um, and thank you to all our speakers for sharing their presentations. Um, we're now going to head into the question portion of the event, which will be facilitated by my colleague, uh, Laura. Um, I'm delighted to welcome back our speakers to take part in this, but also um, our local MPs, Mary Rimmer and Connor McGinn. Um, Laura, Marie and Connor, if you'd uh, like to turn on your cameras, um, we'll be hearing some brief reflections from our MPs first. Um, Marie, if you'd like to go first, followed by Connor, um, and then we'll head into the Q&A session and invite the rest of the speakers to turn their cameras back on. So I'll pass over to you guys now. Thanks, Emma. Um, I wonder, Marie, if you'd like to give a, your reflections on the event first. Extremely informative and lots of um, ideas and um, practical ideas. Um, they just hit you in the face. It's what's needed. What I heard there was things I've picked up, seen, but all brought together with people who are committed to resolving the issues. What is what is short here is it, it, it's a scourge on our society's poverty, and then um, we're the fifth richest country in the world and yet we we see poverty all around us in St Helens and even worse in Nose in another part of my constituency and the system that's in being it, it's already failed us well before Covid they'd like to blame everything on Covid but it's not all Covid and what Covid's done it's exposed this and it's exposed the weaknesses of the, of the um, systems and the impacts on the people that are living in our communities, particularly yeah, St Helens. I'll just talk about St Helens. If we look at St Helens, 16,695 COVID positive cases, the 15th highest in the country, 498 deaths. 
we're in the top 10 of um, poor health in the nation. We have low income poverty. It's no wonder we were hit the way we have been with, with coronavirus. Fuel poverty is one form of, uh, of inequality and it's the knock-on effect of the cost of lives. And you know, when we look at the three wards that one of our colleagues raised today, where we have the highest fuel poverty in St Helens, they're not what you would automatically go to. Rainhill, Eccleston and Billings. If you were to ask councillors or people in the town, they wouldn't pick those as a poorer areas. What they are are areas with bigger properties, with older people living in them, they can't afford or they don't invest in doing them. And that's why I was shocked years ago when I found that Rainhill in, in the town I was, I was leaving at the time was the worst area for poverty. There were the big houses that the inefficient heating, if there was any heating, windows and everything like that. So the retrofit that's come through today is absolutely important. And the, it's what's there now needs to be done. I will make sure that what we've heard today, what's been said today, will be talked about in Westminster. And I want to thank people for, for the contributions. But what we do need more than anything is a government that is focused on the importance of issues to people's lives. The focused and absolutely committed and investment. Local government, yes, needs to be involved. But if you see what local government has done over the last 12 months, everything has come down to local government to start out. It's when national governments got involved, things have gone wrong on distribution of vaccine and things like that. But local government is committed. Housing, um, the, like tourists is the main social provider of housing now. Is, is committed to doing things and do do things. But what we need is long-term investment. But we need investment in the greener. Uh, we need, uh, we need a, um, a national skills council, which the government hasn't come back and accepted as yet, but may UK have set up one of their own, just the industry themselves. We need, it seems to me, we've got all the data about what properties are, what is needed. What we need is the skills and we need the commitment and the, the investment. Investment that gives returns in people's lives, people's quality of life, not necessarily the GDP. And that's what we need to do. We need employers and people who are patient and committed to take the community with us. Social enterprises, We've got social enterprises in Liverpool City region. We've got a bidding for um, what, what they call the um, manufacture, the, the new type construction, uh, modern construction. We need that kind of thing. And we need social enterprises, social people, the churches involved and the community. But more than anything, a government that is interested in people and improving the quality of life and housing has got to come high. Housing and health are the most important things to people. And that's where we need our investment and absolute commitment and focus. Thanks, Mary, for painting that really important picture there. Um, yeah, I think we all agree here today that housing is really high on, on the list for everybody. Um, Connor, I wondered if you would mind giving um, a minute or two reflection on what you've learned from today's event. Laura, thanks to you and hope for the future and to Emma and the team for putting the event together and inviting us along to say a few words and also your partners in Energy Projects Plus because I know they also do really important work here locally through the Save Energy Advice Line, which has been invaluable, I think, for many of my constituents and that partnership they have with the local authority uh, is welcome and we are we are very grateful for it. Uh, I'm also really delighted not just to be following Mary, but also Annie, because I think yeah. in, in Helens, uh, and particularly in uh, my constituency, I have seen the value of faith communities and the work that they do. Just this morning, I visited a project business for youth based in a United Reformed Church. 
-hmm. run in partnership with the local Anglican parish and run by one of my fellow parishioners at St. Mary and St. John's Catholic Church. So I think that shows the value of faith communities working together to provide uh, important services for our community. And I think nowhere is that seen more in terms of uh, how we look after those who are vulnerable in our society and meet the needs of uh, those who are in dire circumstances. I always think of fuel poverty and I want to speak about my experience as a constituency MP because I think we've heard some incredible uh, ideas and suggestions and some of the innovative things that are happening, some of the challenges too from policy experts in this field. I see that Sarah Longlands is on here and uh, her and I were at a virtual event a couple of weeks ago through the Liverpool City Region All Party Group, which I shared around the green recovery and around how we use some of this transformative agenda to bring jobs and growth. But my contention is that can only come after we address the issues of grinding poverty, but also what I think is a hidden poverty when it comes to fuel poverty. And Mary alluded to this, some of the places where this is most acute and where I have cases coming through my constituency office and via various partners like the excellent Citizens Advice Bureau in St Helens who do so much work in this as well, are from areas that others who aren't au fait with some of the minutiae um, in terms of the streets and the issues in those particular villages would think of places like Billinge uh, as affluent. And I know that Rainford particularly as well and my constituency uh, falls victim to that too. But there are also communities like PAR, which I know is one that has been identified by the council in terms of the work it's doing on the Green Homes Grant Scheme, where we do have uh, wider systemic issues around poverty, around attainment, around uh, health inequalities. And this is coupled with poor housing stock and, and the reliance on people, um, the reliance that people have on support through things like uh, universal credit and the uplift that thankfully the government has agreed to continue. Uh, but, but, but we need to be very clear about this. We are in a precarious position because what we're going to find is, and I know there's a great sense of uh, optimism around uh, the vaccine and, a, a, and an anticipation, and I share this too, of being able to see loved ones again when we come out the other side of this but we're also storing up some really significant challenges that we're going to face. When the furlough scheme ends, it's been paying 80% of people's wages. Many of those people in communities like ours are going to find that simply their job doesn't exist anymore. So they're going from 80% to nothing. We're also going to find that too with things like the universal credit uplift. So I think the government needs to be really clear about what its plan is to avoid a cliff edge. And we know that energy bills that have been uh, heightened over the last year, particularly because you have people who are at home a lot. And uh, from my experience through the constituency work that I do, there is always a spike in winter around people coming to me facing problems uh, with paying bills. We know that there are 600,000 households across the UK who are currently in arrears. I run a special debt advice surgery with the CAB uh, and other community groups in February and energy is always one of those. Uh, prevalent issues that 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 comes forth. So I so I, so I think there are the, you know th this is an exciting agenda um, around coupling climate change with a transition to cleaner, greener energy. I'm in favour of us having ambitious targets that we need to meet as a as a country, uh, and will support initiatives that work towards that. I also think alongside that though we need to ensure that it's a fair and a just transition that we address some of the issues we have now around the fuel and energy poverty that people are in where they have to choose between heating and eating, but that we also make sure that people in communities like ours here in St. Helens have the opportunities that perhaps other areas of the country uh, readily have to be able to make, that, to make that transition, to have that sustainable energy source that will bring down their bills and lead to a cleaner, greener future. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Connor. That's really interesting um, to get both your local perspectives there. You've both mentioned COVID quite centrally to your um, conclusions there. So I wondered if we could touch upon this one question that's come in, um, which is, can the UK maintain its commitment to reaching net zero emissions whilst also supporting those that have been most affected by the economic downturn caused by COVID-19? Um, so, Mary, can I come to you first there?
I think it can do, and I think it must do. Um, there, uh, there, there are funds. This is the fifth richest country in the world. And you, the, the government's been able to put its hand on money, and it wastes money. It's wasted enormous amounts of money. And it's not unusual for government to waste, for this government to waste money. There is money there, and we simply have got to, because if we don't address it now, it can just deteriorate and go even worse. Uh, it's, it's absolutely a must to do, and it can be done, given the will and the commitment. And then we need the patience to take people with us. Thanks, Mary. And Connor, anything from you there? I think Mary's put it really succinctly. Uh, we can, we can, and we must. We, 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 we need to have uh, an honest conversation about this, about how we transition. Uh, Paul Nowak, the Deputy General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress, who sits on Bayes' uh, transition board, makes a really important point about this, about transferring skilled workers, like those, for example, at Ellesmere Port at the minute, uh, who work for Vauxhall and JLR, how we transfer them across to new types of technology that there's going to be innovating in in the motor industry. But I also think about things like the HiNet project that we have here in St Helens, it's around hydrogen. In Moss Bank, in my constituency, we have a BOC plant. We're going to use that to be what I would call the, the petrol station or the filling station for the new fleet of hydrogen buses that we're going to have on the Liverpool city region. I'm strongly in favour of nuclear power. You know, I think we need to have a conversation about what we do about that. Uh, and the Northwest has always been a place uh, that has had nuclear power. It's interesting when we've seen this debate in the media over the last week about uh, about reopening a coal mine in uh, Cumbria for cooking coal for steel plants, that we're not talking about some of the nuclear plants that have been envisaged, but that have been stalled. So look, I think it is about being, I think it is about being innovative. And I think it is about, about ensuring that we create new jobs, we create jobs in the green economic recovery, but that we make sure that we take workers who are in skilled jobs at the minute and move them across to these new technologies so we ensure we aren't leaving people behind. Look, we were an industrial powerhouse in St Helens and in the northwest of England before. There's no reason why we can't be again. We need to get ahead of this with things like glass futures, with things like the hydrogen and high net project in the, in, in, in the Northwest. And if we do that, and if we claim it, there's no reason why we can't make it a success here. And actually I would turn it around. How do we use it to lift our communities and create jobs and economic growth? Mm -hmm. Thanks Connor, very empowering answer there. I think we all feel inspired by that one. I wonder if I could ask all of the speakers to turn their cameras on um, just to get everyone involved in these conversations for the last couple of minutes. Um, Connor is mentioning green jobs there, which is obviously central to this whole retrofit agenda. Um, potentially um, coming to Peter, and then maybe Mary and Connor want to feed in as well. But Peter, in order to ensure that green jobs are available to young people in the Northwest and they'll be available for the long term, from your experience, how can we foster consumer trust in um, the process of retrofitting homes while closing the skills gap? Um, have you got anything to add to that one? Um, well, to, to, to be fair to the government, they've introduced uh, past 2035, which is the sort of new um, standards that are expected will, will come into being later this year um, to ensure that consumer protection is included. Um, I, I confess, though, it will be, you know, the, the, the true test will be in its delivery. Um, you know, we know that currently contractors are committed to good quality work but there is a, a, a almost a secondary industry out there of um, people who drum up the, the, the measures effectively they become a, a sort of a referral into the scheme and they are unregulated as, at, at the moment and you know just just before Christmas you know we took a call that, that I ended up having to, to, to support on where a, a chap um, had spoken to his father on the phone and while his father was on the phone he had a knock at the door and he let somebody in who was literally just cold calling to, to do eco um, and um, he, he, he got on the bounce to us because he also had, his dad also had a leaflet from ourselves and so he made two and two equal five and we were able to, to, to solve that issue uh, and reassure the householder and what have you but um, we, we 
it's not just the actual direct installations, you know, the insurances, the 25 year insurance back guarantee or whatever it's going to be. I don't know if Philip can talk more about this, uh, but it's actually just simple, basic uh, health and safety as well at the front end. Thanks, Peter. Um, and I wonder if Philip or Sarah wanted to jump in on this question. Um, but given the funding and skills gaps that have been identified today in, in the talks we've listened to, do we think the net zero carbon targets for retrofit are achievable in light of these of these skills and funding gaps? Um, Sarah, maybe coming to you first. Um, I think it, it depends on on how quickly the system can respond. And, and we wrote a bit about this in, in our report when we were thinking about um, housing retrofit and particularly heat pump rollout. Um, so I appreciate it's going to be different depending on, on what you're looking at. But when, when we were looking at it, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation because um, you kind of you need to develop the skills in order to to respond to, to the um, potential market. But at the same time, um, until there's actually uh, a demand for it, people don't necessarily see the arguments. And um, we in, in the work that we've done, we've we've suggested that, that what, what you need to do is um, a bit of both, really. Um, so I think just making people aware of the potential opportunities that um, retrofit and, and, um, uh, and, and uh, low carbon housing pre presents. Um, and also, I think, trying to join up the conversation at a central government level, because, you know, for example, with, with plumbing courses and, and, and um, courses where you can become a, a heating engineer, you aren't necessarily aware that there are other opportunities within that to do things beyond gas boilers. So trying to to widen opportunities at that end. And at the same time, a lot of colleges only have like one enrollment term uh, for those courses per year. Um, and so perhaps encouraging um, central government to think about, well, can the, uh, the Department of Education talk to um, Department of, of uh, Industrial Strategy and Business? Um, and can they talk to DEFRA about the net carbon and kind of getting them to coordinate so that there's encouragement for colleges to do more courses uh, on a regular basis so to, to, to try to build the demand um, but at the same time also sort of joining up some of the priorities um, so that they're kind of working together on it because I think sometimes it can can feel a bit sort of disjointed so I think that that's um, that's uh, certainly a way forward and I think there's a lot you can do through public procurement as well so like a lot of local authorities are taking a lead on this so if there are building uh, if they've got new buildings actually using that to um, employ local people provide apprenticeships and and, and give people the, the skills training that they need and I think that can help to sort of drive demand um, and a lot of housing associations have done that as well so sort of really taking a lead on it and um, helping to kind of de-risk it um, and show that it, it can actually generate uh, real jobs and real opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thanks Sarah that's really great to hear I don't know if Philip you had any other comments to add there yeah, so I would say that um, from the budget, we saw a variety of different retraining schemes, things called kickstart, restart or whatever. And there's a role for local authorities in terms of lobbying the national government to make sure that all of those schemes relate directly to the net zero transition and aren't just about um, reskilling people into obsolete jobs, but that this is something that can really help take forward the net zero uh, transition and then to address the demand point I think there's also a role for local authorities to set their own retrofit strategies and targets to that cements the demand but also if you have a national retrofit strategy which we've been campaigning for with other organizations such as the Federation for Master Builders and the Construction Industry Leadership Council that you have that leadership and commitment on the national level that retrofit is definitely an agenda that will have um, spending behind it, then that builds that commitment to the demand that you can then see translate through um, into the business case for investment in things like training or filling the skills gap. And then you can also, um, local authorities can use their local education budgets to, or responsibilities to push retrofit and and finally, you can also use local authorities' own buildings um, and the stock that they have or direct control over and direct responsibility for to start to develop the supply chains locally through their own stock and their own procurement. So there's a variety of different things that can be done. And I would say definitely the answer is yes to that the retrofit targets could be achieved. 
but we need to start now. We need to accelerate what we're doing. Great, thanks, Philip. Um, apologies, we're out of time for Q and A there, um, but we have a list of all of the questions that were asked in today's event. So, if the speakers don't mind, we'll be putting those um, written in written form, um, and we can get them to everyone who asked those questions. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Emma now to bring us to a close. Hi, yeah, thank you um, to all of our speakers today. And I'm really sorry that uh, we didn't get through too many of the questions, but as Laura said, uh, we'll make sure that we get those sent to the speakers and get some written answers uh, circulated for everyone who registered for the event today. Um, and that does bring our event to a close. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, please look out for that follow-up email. Uh, there'll be one coming later this afternoon with a link to uh, the recording, and then we'll send one out with uh, the speaker slides and um, some answers to those questions a little bit later next week. Um, a feedback form will pop up in your browser when you close this window. Uh, if you do have a couple of minutes, it'd be great if you could fill that in. Uh, I'd also just like to take this opportunity to thank the European Climate Foundation for funding our events work this year and making events like this possible. Uh, so as we're one minute over time, I'm just going to end by saying thank you to all of our wonderful speakers for your fantastic presentations and outlining you know, this really important issue so clearly. Um, thank you to our constituency team, I know who are on the call, and the local councillors who've also attended today. Our Hope for the Future team behind the scenes, Hannah and Tom, um, and also a huge thank you to all of the audience members for attending as well. Uh, I hope you all have a brilliant weekend and uh, thanks again. <laughs>